I'm going on an adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. Last time on The Naked Archaeologist. Fakes and forgeries in the Holy Land. The James Ossuary, a stone burial box with the inscription, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. If authentic, this box held the bones of the brother of Jesus of Nazareth. It surfaced in 2002 and was called the greatest archeological find of the last century. A direct physical link to Jesus. And then it was labeled the greatest forgery of modern times. Oded Golan about to go on trial for the alleged forgery of the century. These are his accusers. Yoni Haggis. We have a forger here, a forger of artifacts who uh, systematically sold and fabricated history. A Jerusalem cop who thinks Golan is a pathological liar. I have, in my career, investigated hundreds of people, maybe thousands, and I can tell which one is lying after a very short time. And Odette Golan, his body language right from the start tells me, I'm lying, I'm lying, I'm lying. And Amir Ganor, a gun-toting archaeologist. He works for the Israel Antiquities Authority, or IAA. He thinks the inscription is a fake, and that Golan is a thief. They claim that they investigated 100 people, that I'm heading an international mafia, uh, that a lot of scholars from all around the world who are paleographers and epigraphers and archaeologists and geologists and chemists and artists and dealers. They're, they're all in your pay, right? All, everyone, uh, are, are all involved in the international conspiracy. Golan's defenders are secretly meeting in this Jerusalem greasy spoon. Well, they're not really so much defending Golan as attacking his accusers at the Israel Antiquities Authority. I am convinced that the, that the committee's findings are deeply, deeply flawed. Accusers, defenders, and Golan and the ossuary. But can't science decide what's fake? Depends who you ask. The IAA says isotope tests prove the inscription is fake. The IAA's critics okay, let's analyze this area. say the test is faulty. Handwriting experts say a second hand added, forged the all-important brother of Jesus. Except for those experts who say, I think it's nonsense. It's I agree, hand, I whether, agree with it. Whether, for, whether forged or authentic, it is one hand. Yeah. Those are the players, except for one, and he's dead. So maybe he won't mind waiting just a little bit longer for an introduction. Archaeology works by comparing one object to another. We learn about this piece of pottery by comparing it to that one, pieces of a puzzle. And to get the full picture of Golan's story, we need to gather pieces, compare Golan to an earlier case. In the 1870s, the Holy Land was an archaeological wild west. 
No isotope tests, no carbon dating, no official system for digging and protecting sites. Everyone prospecting for the big find. Fame, fortune. Enter Moses Wilhelm Shapira. He was a very strange character. He was a Apatkan in... Adventure. Adventure. Irit Salmon curates Jerusalem's Tico House, a house once owned by Moses Shapira. He betrayed his home, his religion, his country, his wife, his profession, his everything. Shapira had a life of scams, but his most audacious went all the way to the monarch. So Queen Victoria was involved. Queen in Victoria was involved. Yeah. Why was Queen Victoria involved? Shapira offered the British Museum scrolls that he said were an ancient copy of the Book of Deuteronomy. The price tag was so big, it needed Queen Victoria's purse. Do you know how much he wanted? Well, we're talking 1880, so a few thousand dollars we're talking? One million sterling in 1880. Today it's a lot of money, but that it was for It was like a billion dollars. Something like that. Shapira claimed to have a 2,000-year-old copy of a biblical text. It was the James Ossuary of its day. And like the James Ossuary, Shapira's fake drew attention from all over the world because archaeology isn't just stones and shovels. Archaeology is politics, power, and money. And it's money, cash, dollars, shekels that worries this group of academics meeting in a Jerusalem greasy spoon. This is amazing. This is a biblical archaeology food fest. It's fantastic. The IAA says private collections like Oded Golan's are suspicious because profit drives the market. Too much money warps archaeology. But these academics have another money theory. Not enough money causes problems too. The amount of funds that the IAA receives from the government is very meager. If inscriptions of this sort turn out to be authentic and are sold in museums for enormous amounts of money, what's going to happen is that a lot of people are going to look for inscriptions where inscriptions were found previously. Now, if the IAA has to protect and guard these sites 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all of the money that they receive from the government is going to have to go on the protection and the guarding of these sites. Yeah, what you're saying is the IAA, the Israel Antiquities Authority, is basically, they're security guards on it. The way security guards protect banks, they're supposed to protect uh, antiquity sites. So just like a security company that failed to protect the bank, the best way to protect themselves is to declare whatever money this, the thieves got away with as fake money. Somebody made it in their basement. It wasn't the real money. Money, politics. Wait a minute. I thought archaeology was a science. Let's go back to the science. Some of the first tests conducted on the ossuary were at the Royal Ontario Museum in 2002. Ed Keel was the curator. I asked him if the IAA report calling the ossuary a fake has convinced him. No, I, I still maintain that uh, it's conceivable that we were duped by a brilliant forger. But my position, and I feel very strongly about this, is that the information that we were given, the IAA report, I had serious flaws in it, and that's because they presented it without cross-examination. And it simply wouldn't stand up in a court of law. The forensic evidence, if you like, the, uh, the isotope report that they presented was seriously flawed. The isotope test looked at the inscription at the molecular level to see if someone had tampered with it. The ossuary failed the isotope test, but it passed many others. It passed every other test, including yes. the, the ultraviolet test that you guys did. We didn't spot anything suspicious. Everything looked clean. Twice it passed the electron microscope test. Nothing suspicious. No, there is nothing suspicious here. It passed everything. 
The ossuary passed the electron microscope. It passed the ultraviolet. It failed the isotope. But only half the inscription failed. Surprisingly, not the half everyone suspected. You see, the ossuary is valuable because it says Jesus. So if you're the forger, you'd think that would be the bit that you would forge. The idea was that the first part of the inscription is real. James, son of Joseph. And then someone came in and snuck in the words brother of Jesus. So it was the Jesus that was fake. Yep. So then along they come with this isotope test. Then the very word that was most in question, Jesus, passes the test. Yeah, it passed the test. So suddenly it's the first part now that's fake. And, you know, it was like a switcheroo. This is the IAA committee report from a woman on the committee. Now get this. The end of the inscription, brother of Jesus, appears authentic. And that's the only part that the indictment says is a forgery. So if you want to know why I say that it's badly bungled, that's why. The science isn't clear. Politics is at play. So the question comes up, is the IAA prosecuting Golan because they think he's a forger, or is it because they can't stand private collectors and it's time to make an example? police say we should ignore objects found by tomb raiders. But what if tomb raiders find the best stuff? Israel Finkelstein is an archaeologist at Tel Aviv University. He thinks there's no way tomb raiders will find better things than trained academics. We are excavating in Jerusalem for a century and more, century and a half. Every square meter in Jerusalem has been excavated. By professional excavations. Professional excavations, yeah. big time. I mean, in major excavations, consortium of universities, going with hundreds of students. You're saying the professionals found very little. Found very, relatively very little. And then you have the robbers sneaking, you know, into a site or a, or a cave at night, you know, with candles, you know. Two of them under the threat of the inspectors and the police, and they have like two seconds to work, and they come with hundreds of uh, uh, inscriptions. Uh, come on, come on. I, do, would you believe that? Yeah, good. You know why? Because so, you painted a picture of two robbers with candles with the cops on their tail. I have a different picture. You have organized digs that need funding, that need volunteers, that need permits that can't just dig everything up, have to go systematically. And then you have hundreds, if not thousands, of young men, unemployed, scouring the countryside. They don't need funding, they don't need volunteers, they don't need permits, and they're following no rules. Of course they're gonna come up with more stuff than the organized digs. No, I don't agree with you. Finkelstein's logic is this. Academics didn't find many artifacts. The Tomb Raiders did. Finkelstein can't believe Tomb Raiders would succeed where academics fail. So the Tomb Raiders must be faking it. Then, selling their fakes to antiquities shops. I put the question to Gil Haya, a Jerusalem antiquities dealer. Haya says bullae are best to illustrate the argument. And the bullas are extremely, extremely difficult to fake. Hello, all you people out there in Gameland. Today, we're going to play an exciting new game called... Surreal or fake? Can you spot the fake? Bullai is either A... An ancient lump of clay used to make seals on papyrus documents. Bullai. Or B... The schoolyard tough guy who stole your lunch money. Boule. I'll do anything you say. OK, Skipper. Uh, Boule is a piece of clay, so if a piece of dirt, so fine dirt into dirt, it's like finding a piece of hay into a haystack, not a needle. <laughs> 
Only Arabs could spend the time to find those bullas in digs, in official digs. They would never find them. And if they use uh, volunteers from universities in America, which are not, don't have a trained eye, and will never find these little things. So you don't think uh, she would find as good stuff as the no, local she Palestinians? She would never be able to find a bullah in a millionaire. Illegal diggers are sometimes better than the professionals. Yeah, much, much better. Much better, yeah. Professor Finkelstein said to me, everything is fake unless proven real. That comes in the antiquities market. And he said, how do you explain? We archaeologists, with, you know, with all our training, hardly found any seals, bullai, or anything. And all of these Palestinian youth with little candles, they find everything. What is, what is he expecting to find with 20 students from America for two weeks every summer? compared to 500 or 1,000 people digging one site for seven years, day and night, you know? Make the calculation and that's Finkelstein it. Finkelstein is wrong? Yeah, Finkelstein is wrong. <laughs> it's completely wrong. Look at this stuff. So, who finds the best stuff? Academics or tomb raiders? The question matters, because the people who find the stuff are the people who have the power to write history. There's our ossuary. Oded Golan and the ossuary might be grabbing headlines now, but in 1883, it was Shapira who was in the media spotlight when he claimed to have the oldest copy of a biblical text in the world, 70 ancient scrolls from the Book of Deuteronomy. He offered it to Queen Victoria and the British Museum for a million pounds. The whole world came here to see, wow, it's really... And as I said before, the whole world was very, very interested in archaeology, in the Bible, and the Old Testament. And so uh, they exhibited one of the parchments to the public, and the line was around the British Museum. This is how he faked it. First, he took a scroll that was about 300 years old. Then he got the scissors out. He cut the margin of the manuscript, of the scrolls, cut it. And on them, he wrote the new text. So he, to... he had a real 16th century scroll. Yes. He cut the bottom, the empty part. Mm -hmm. And he says, if I just add some letters over here, I've got it made. I can sell it for equivalent of a billion dollars. And he almost succeeded. He almost succeeded. But it was not to be. Extra, extra, $3 about it. Dear Mr. Bond, the manuscript of Deuteronomy, which Mr. Shapira submitted to us for examination, is a forgery, as the interest which it has excited is so An investigation great, the revealed the scam. Shapira fled London. Shapira gives us good reasons to suspect private collectors and private antiquities dealers. But we can't forget some of the world's most important artifacts come from private collectors. Most of the more important items were not found in official excavations. The most important inscriptions, for example, ever found in Israel. The Meisha Stella, which was found in Jordan. The Dead Sea Scrolls, they were all found in unofficial excavations. The Dead Sea Scrolls give us insight into Golan and the Ossuary. Here's the tale. In 1947, a goat wandered into a desert cave. Its Bedouin owner followed the goat into the cave where he discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is it. This is the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. How that goat got into this place, I have no idea. The scrolls entered the private market, just like the James Ossuary. For years, some people called the scrolls fake, just like the James Ossuary. Now, academics recognize the Dead Sea Scrolls as the world's oldest and most important biblical documents. This is the real thing, right? This is the real thing. This is the real this thing. It's incredible. The great Isaiah scroll here. Peter Flint, co-director of the Dead Sea Scrolls Institute at Trinity University in Langley, British Columbia. There's something very good about this forgery issue and, and, and all these controversies because um, 
despite all the all, all the hoopla and all, all all the noise, I'm quite pleased because this people are saying, hey, the ancient past, the Bible, the scrolls, um, the statues, the ostries, these things matter. It just needs to be what he wrote. But when these first appeared on the private market, they were suspected as fakes. So I asked Professor Flint about the current fakes and forgeries debate surrounding Odet Golan and the ossuary. Let me use an analogy that would be very helpful for your question. Um, you, we all get computer bugs, and there are very smart people all around the world who are trying to write a bug or a, a virus that's smart enough to fool everybody, and sometimes they do. And I think in the forgeries market, there are some people who see this as a great challenge. Can I forge an inscription that will fool the scholars? And I think some of them are doing that. Maybe as a game, others for money. You don't and, respect those guys. Well, I, I would say no, because I think the motivation is to get rich or to get glory. Grudgingly? Grudgingly? Well, you know, it's, it's like a counterfeiter of money. It's like someone who, who counterfeits a million dollars. You, uh, you do admire him, but he's a crook. <laughs> <laughs> right. The crook in our tale, Moses Shapira, fled London, wandered around the continent until finally, in a Rotterdam hotel, he shot himself. As for his fakes, the scrolls, thousands of pieces of pottery, well, there was a twist. Shapira's fakes started to be valued. The IAA owns them. Also, the uh, Department of Antiquity has some, and also the Israel Museum has some. There are also Archive. private archaeologists who have some pieces at home. And when I had the exhibition, even two of the stone heads uh, were uh, for sale in one of the antiquity shops here in Jerusalem. But well, they're still sell selling yeah, this stuff. They're still yeah. selling it. Today, there is a value to the fakes as well, but it's a fake. I know, but these are really good fakes. Good fakes. Or at least famous fakes. Yeah. The fake antiquity, after enough time, takes on value. Value as curiosity, as history, as kitsch. Archaeology can be a topsy-turvy world. As for Golan, as he awaits his trial, he finds his own world taking strange twists. But this is just, uh, you know, Kafkaesque situation. It's ridiculous. Kafka, eh? Kafka. You're in the world of Kafka now? I'm in the world of Kafka. It affected my life, it affected my collection, um, and it affected science, after all, and it affected the truth. Truth? As we've just seen, it's not just shovels and stones. Archaeology is a world of politics, cash, and envy. Is the ossuary fake? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls came from the antiquities market, and some called them fakes for years. Now they're known as the most important biblical documents in the world. So even after Golan's criminal trial, the so-called archaeological trial of the century, it's unlikely that we'll have heard the last word on the ossuary mystery.